Did I get that? Oh, there we go. Hi, I'm Bob Watson. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about planning your API documentation. And I think I figured out the reason I'm last is because I'm going to tell you the secret to successful of documentation. And so if I, if I did this first, we could just all go home yesterday. But here I am. And the secret to successful documentation is to know your audience, tell them what they want and what they need to know, and there you're done. So thank you. Um, <laughs> but as you know, if you've done any of this for any amount of time, uh, these are way easier to do than they are to put on a PowerPoint. And so I'm here to tell you some of the, the things that I've picked up along the way to help me know my audience and help me know what they need to know so that I can have successful documentation. And so the, the things that I've found that, uh, that in, uh, aspects that influence my documentation are more than just the audience. Uh, it's also the, the market and the product that you're documenting for the market in the, uh, for that audience. And so these are some of the things, the questions that I've asked and the information that I've found that influence the documentation most, so that you can then identify those aspects and then create a plan that will help you create the perfect documentation, or at least the best documentation you can, uh, for the audience that you're working for. So a real quick recap, and part of the reason this is so complicated, is these are just some of the types of documentation you need to write for an API. You have the overview, which is the value proposition of your API. Why would anybody care about it? What, what, what's it going to do for them? Uh, the hello world, which is the first use case. And that's to demonstrate that you can actually live up to your value proposition. So you've attracted them with your value proposition. You've demonstrated that you can do it. So now the, the, your customer, or your potential customer, is going to want to try to apply that. So you have tutorials and examples that show them how they can take your product and use it to solve their problems. Uh, sometimes you might need conceptual documentation for the readers who want to learn about it, uh, more than just actually apply it and hope it works. Some want to learn why it works and how to apply it better. And then there's the reference documentation, which I call the finish documentation, because the the times that I've used reference documentation the most are when I'm trying to fill in the gaps uh, that the tutorial might have between their examples and my particular application. And then last but not least is the informal documentation, which is what everybody else is writing about your product. And we'll talk about that, because you want to factor that in so that you can uh, complement that. So that's a lot of documentation. But it turns out you might not need to write it all at once, which is a good thing because that's really hard. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is how to use that, that ordering to your advantage. So it's kind of like the documentation judo and using the momentum of the uh, audience and the product and the market to your advantage as opposed to have it uh, be to your disadvantage. So let's... Uh, talk about the, so the, the, these are dynamic constructs. And so that's the first thing to understand, is that your audience isn't static. Uh, your market isn't static. Uh, the product is probably not static either. And so you need to learn how to sort of get into the moment, the, the, the rhythm of those parts and know what's important and when it's important so that your documentation can be there for your audience. And to do that, as I've heard several speakers already say, you need to have a plan, and you need to plan for the plan to change. So let's talk about that. We'll start with the audience. Um, I don't know whose audience this is. Maybe it's yours. Um, <laughs> but the audience, what I found, and I've tried to categorize these in sort of the big pictures, the, the big impacts, because it's all really interconnected, and that's what complicates this. So I've tried to separate them out but as you see these separate sort of influences, remember that the separation is artificial. Uh, they, they're all working together. And so the audience determines what you write. So what do you need to, to do to, to, to connect with your uh, customer? Now the audience for API documentation 
might be the developers, they might be executives making purchase decisions, uh, they might be system integration engineers making recommendations to developers and executives. Uh, API documentation is, is complicated, not only because it's technical, but it's solving a lot of problems for a lot of uh, a large audience or a lot of different audiences. And so the key aspect of the audience to know for this particular problem and how it affects your documentation is know what the audience wants to solve, know their problems, and how they solve them. And those are the two factors that I've seen that influence the documentation uh, as far as uh, for the audience properties. So it's the what problems do they want to solve? So I've characterized this as they can be system problems, and for some software, you're dealing with large interconnected uh, components that all work together, hopefully. Uh, and other, other, other APIs are solving sort of task or smaller problems, like utilities and uh, tool-type level APIs. So understand where your product is on that spectrum. Then the other thing is, is how, do they, how do your developers or your audience solve those problems? How do they, how do they apply it? What's their coding style? Now, we've heard, I've heard talk about personas, and I want to make sure that it's clear that the coding style isn't the same as a persona. Because the coding style is how they attack the problem, and one particular persona might attack different problems different ways. Uh, and so, the, I've summarized these, and this is based on research uh, Microsoft Research did uh, know, 14 years ago. And I've paraphrased them and updated it. But there's a copy and paste coder. I'm, I'm sure everybody's met one of those. I'm sure everybody's been one of those, uh, where you just want to solve a sh small problem quickly, find an example, make it work, it works, and then on to the next thing. Okay. Uh, for, for different problems, there's the try it first, and then figure out why it didn't work the first time. Uh, that's usually where I end up, um, especially when the API or the, or the uh, looks like it'll, you know, it looks like you can figure it out, so it's like you go as far as you can, and then you go to the documentation to sort of bridge the remaining gap. And then there's these, I think these are, um, I don't know about as common as maybe Bigfoot, but you're in the Northwest, maybe that's more common than other places. But there are developers who actually want to know how it works uh, before they try to use it. And so uh, they exist. If they're in your audience, then that's good to know because you need to talk to them differently than you would for, say, a copy and paste uh, developer. So know the problems they want to solve. And the little thumb up here, you'll see that. Those are the sort of, if you're in a hurry, What's the one thing you need to know when you really need to know all of them, but you don't have time for that? Um, know the size of the problem, because that's going to give you an indication of how uh, that's, that's the most likely, or that's the, the, the factor that affects your documentation the most. How are they going to, what size of problems are going to be solved by the, by, the, by the product? And so then there's the market. And the market is where your uh, product is found and, and acquired. Uh, sometimes it's bought, sometimes it's just downloaded. But the market de determines what you write first. And so some of the things to consider about the market, and these are the questions you would ask someone who would know uh, about the market, are who's buying it? Or is this something that, the, um, uh, that you have a sales team going out selling, or is this something that people find on their own through social media or a web presence? Uh, how competitive is the API? Is your product, you know, fighting uh, elbow to elbow with other products, or is it like the only thing that does it, and so if they want to solve that problem, they come to you, uh, and there's, there's no other choice. How mature is the API? Is this, a, is this a new API that's bringing new features to the market? Or has this API been around for a while? Each of these affect you know, your documentation perspective. So for the high touch sales, those are the ones that have the, the sales team that go out and make sales calls. And, and uh, these are usually bigger ticket items because that's uh, uh, how you can pay for the salesman. Uh, focus on using the API because the sales team is doing the selling. Now there's going to be some support for that. 
And so it's not just one or the other, but once they've sold it, uh, you want to have a successful developer experience. For the low touch sales, which maybe, I don't know, maybe that's more common, that's where uh, there's no dedicated sales team and it's word of mouth, open source type of uh, documentation or products might fall into this category. Uh, then you need to have you know, a clear value proposition, a clear uh, hello world case, so that people can see that it does what they want to do and then try it to verify that. Uh, another factor of the market is who buys it versus um, who uses it. Sometimes that's the same person, you know, in like say the low touch case where it's, uh, you find it, download it and use it. And sometimes that's, uh, those are separate. You might have a, uh, an executive team making the purchase because it's a big ticket item and then you want uh, the developers or in some cases developers might be contracted to use it. So know, know if those are different or the same because that'll determine how you structure your content. Uh, and then understand the com com competition. Are you gonna need your documentation to help the API stand out in the crowd? Or there isn't a crowd, so standing out isn't an issue. And finally, you know, how familiar is the API to the market uh, so that you know how to, uh, to talk to them about it? Uh, you, do you have to introduce it? Or do, you, or, the, or do they know you already? And so the, the, the thumbs up item for the market is how is it sold? Because that's gonna have the biggest impact that I found uh, on what your documentation workload is. The rest of it sort of kind of fine tunes it, but this is the big one. And then finally there's the product. Uh, that's not an API, that's, but it's hard to take a picture of an API. Uh, and so the product, this is a little more complicated, but what really the biggest impact on documentation I've seen is how your product fits with the audience and the market that we've just learned about. Uh, so I'm gonna use a, a, an example here. So in, in this case, my, my product is a, a mitten and, a ball, and a, a ball of yarn and some knitting needles in the back there. And my audience categories are the cold person and the knitting hobbyist. And I thought I saw some out there, so. Uh, I hope I get this right. So if, you, if you're to, to, to talk to the cold person about mittens, there's not a whole lot to say. The, the user interface is pretty simple. The, the application is pretty straightforward. So this is gonna be a really light documentation load. Trying to sell the mitten to the knitting hobbyist could be a little more difficult. Like they might not even be interested because it's already done. There's nothing to do. Now for the cold person who's looking at a ball of yarn or a box of balls of yarn, uh, they're gonna need a lot of help to turn that into something that, they're, they're, that will solve their problem. Uh, so that's gonna be a really serious documentation load. You might need to offload that or reference other content. Um, but it's gonna be, uh, you'll have your work cut out for you. And then again, the knitting hobbyists, when they see the ball of yarn uh, and the needles, they're ready to go. Uh, you might want to give them a pattern or something, but they'll probably, they know exactly what to do with that. So that's uh, going to be not as much documentation and certainly not as much as uh, uh, our poor cold person who's still staring at a, uh, a box of yarn. So let's look, look at that in API context. Um, so we have our copy and paste and study and apply readers. And we have APIs that are built for copy and paste and APIs that are built for study and apply. Now sometimes that, that distinction here is intentional, sometimes it's accidental, um, but it's important for you to know it because that's gonna affect how much documentation you need to write. So for the copy and paste reader who has a copy and paste API, and that's gonna be one where there, it's a pretty simple use case, there's not a whole lot of variables, the, the the, the nomenclature used by the API matches the domain and the problem that's being solved, so it's a, obvious to see the relationships. It's consistent, the con interconnections and workings are the same. There's not a whole lot to explain because it just looks like it works. So that's gonna be pretty straightforward. You might show them how it's gonna be used, how it can solve your problem, but they'll figure it out. Now the study and apply reader can still use a copy and paste API, 
but they might want to know a little bit about it before they feel comfortable just copying and pasting. So if that's your audience, you might need to provide some more conceptual content so they can get comfortable with the inner workings before they start pasting it into their application. Now again, like with our, our poor cold person and box of yarn, the study and apply API for a copy and paste user is going to be a really big, a steep learning curve because you're going to have to explain how the API works and how to use it and how to be really specific in the, uh, the applications, making, creating copy and paste code for them is going to be a lot of work. And, you know, a study and apply API generally is a more complicated API that's got more settings, more options. Uh, it might have an arbitrary mapping between the, the terms used in the API and the problem, so you have to explain when the API does this, it's going to do this to your system, it's not obvious. And so you really have to study it to know how to use it. Well, the copy and paste developer would prefer not to, uh, so you need to, to back that up. This could be a pretty frustrating experience for them. On the other hand, the study and apply developer is going to feel right at home studying the documentation to apply this. They're, they're expecting configuration parameters and things like that. And so, um, oops. So your job here is just to provide the information they'll need. Uh, it's probably going to, it's definitely going to be more than these, maybe not so much as this. But this is going to be a, a, a bigger challenge than the other quadrants. And so understanding how your API matches the, the customer will give you a sense of you know, what kind of documentation workload are you signing up for. So the key thing here is that the documentation is the bridge, so I guess we've used that already, um, between the, the, the development style of the customer and the development style that's facilitated by the, docu by, the, by the product. And so the thumbs up here is don't forget all the other things that go into that, uh, describing the product, whether it's configuration, accounts, uh, permissions, all those kind of things, because those can really um, uh, help you avoid a frustrating experience or, or create a smooth onboarding experience. Uh, when they first start applying it. So let's put it all together. We're not going to need a rivet gun and a bucking bar, fortunately. But we're going to look at the different products and how you turn this into a plan, because that's what you really want to do. Uh, so that, as uh, several have already said, you need a plan, if only so you can go home and sleep at night so that you know that uh, the work will be OK to, on the next day. So after you've looked at your audience, your market, and your product, and you got all those pieces figured out, uh, you can come up with sort of the, the master plan, like if we could create everything we needed, this is what it would look like. And so we have this big pyramid of content. But then you refine that down into sort of the ideal plan for your particular situation in the market with the product. Uh, and you might you know, move these around. Maybe you need more of these and not so much of that. Uh, but that's what you, that's, you get that information from understanding those three uh, factors. And so the final step is to organize this or prioritize this. I think in, in Sprint, this would be creating your backlog uh, or however you want to schedule your tasks. And so these are some ways to break that down into bite-sized pieces. Uh, the first is content type. Uh, this is like great for checking the boxes off. Uh, I'm not sure this addresses customer needs, but it might. Uh, it might there might be other practical factors, uh, such as subject matter expertise, or, or uh, you know, as you get trained and up to speed, you might have to do these first. Uh, but this is one order. Uh, this is an order I've seen in, in agile, explaining Agile documentation, where you have your big list of features and, and content, uh, but then you sort of shave off slices to get more and more of each over time. And that's also an organized way, but I haven't seen reality match that, uh, even though it's a good conceptual model. So what I've seen is it looks more like this. Um, 
You know, your first half, you might have uh, a lot of emphasis on the home page and the value proposition because it's getting out there and you need to make an impression. Uh, you'll have to have enough tutorials and enough reference content uh, to sell those other aspects. And then the next time uh, your home page is okay, it just needs a little work, you might need some more value proposition and uh, another demo or something and so on. And so uh, the reason I'm showing this is so that you kind of give yourself permission to have a plan that looks like this, because this is the plan that fits your market, your audience, and your product. And, and that's what's important. Uh, th this plan looks organized, but it's, it's not gonna fit. Well, it, it might, but it probably won't. So feel free to use this. Um, you know, if your plan looks messy, the, the important thing is that it fits. And so, that's the secret to successful documentation from what I've seen. It's know your audience, but know your audiences, the market and the product. That's what you need to know to, to draft your documentation. Tell them what they need to know and know when they need to know it. So you can synchronize that. And then you'll have success. And the, part, the, the, the final the thought that I wanna leave you with, if, if you haven't heard this already, is that you're the documentation experts. You know, you need to take control. And so I hope my talk has given you some ways to help you take control and have a smooth landing with your documentation. So thank you.